All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out this evening so we can share our Summit Public Schools bond issuance plan for you. Um, I'm Scott Huff, I'm superintendent of schools, and I could not be more excited to discuss our future plans for our schools here tonight. Uh, first of all, let me get started by saying we are all really very grateful to be working in a school community that celebrates and invests in excellence in education. Summit Public Schools has a long-standing history of success with this approach, and whether it be district accolades or district rankings, or even individual student or group accolades, or even the fact that we have built a reputation on being one of the best public schools in the state of New Jersey to prepare our students for the future. We're all very grateful that we work in this community and live in this community. And I want to thank the Board of Education, our educational professionals, our parent community, and certainly our students community because they give us the energy to continue to uh, thrive forward and excel. I'm going to share with you a little bit about what you can expect this evening. Uh, we do have a presentation for you. Uh, we're going to start by explaining a little bit of what is a bond mechanism for funding in a public school setting. Um, that's going to include some past bonds that Summit Public Schools has issued to take care of projects in the past, the debt associated with that, and how we handle that debt. Um, including with that is really an understanding of that this is basically a common practice to take care of large-scale projects that can't otherwise be done through the operating budget. And we've done this in the past, so we're going to share some information with you about that. Secondly, last month, um, the team did do a detailed presentation about our plans for facility and educational enhancements with this bond. I know many of you in this room either weren't able to attend or watch live, so we are prepared to give you a detailed summary of that plan and really share what we're excited about in this bond, again, to provide those educational and facility enhancements for our community. Thirdly, we will go through the process, some of the steps that were taken to date to get us to this point and what's remaining in this process for us to complete the, the entire uh, process from start to finish, which is, is pretty extensive. And being that we're a type one school district has a little differences and you might be familiar with from other school districts. And finally, we really want to engage in a conversation with all of you. That's what this is designed for. That's why we're here, a Q&A. Um, we want to hear your questions, or give you an opportunity to come up to the podium, make a statement, ask a question. We'll have a panel of experts up here district administrators and educators from various departments who are well versed in this bond and will be able to answer your concerns and hope put some context or some understanding into some of the situations that you feel apply to you and your family. So with that, before I move on, I, I really want to say that we come here tonight and we're here for this proposal because as a community, we are very, very passionate about servicing our students, their needs, and preparing them for the future. Our motivation is student-centered. We're fueled by the enthusiasm by our educational professionals, our parent community, our Board of Education support, and certainly, again, as I go back to the students, and that's why we're here. And we're focused on Summit Public School students. That's our focus, that's our concern, and doing what we need to do to prepare them for the future. But with that, we do seek partnership with the community. We know that there are many, many stakeholders in the city of Summit, and when it comes to our schools, in large part, our schools are the hub of the community. When our schools are successful, we all benefit. We understand that. So we ask for your input, we value your input, and we listen. And along with that comes transparency. Total transparency about our options, our decisions, the reasons why, and we'll share that with you. When you start to see our proposals for facility enhancements and educational programming enhancements, you're not going to see the first draft. You're not going to see the second draft. We went through many, itera many iterations of this plan to make sure that we get a responsible balance of what our students need now and in the future and do it in a fiscally responsible manner. We understand our leadership role in this process and the stewardship that we have in this community, and we take it very seriously. So initially, I'm going to be joined by Derek Jess, Business Administrator, uh, Jen McCann, Director of Education, Stacy Romaldi, High School Principal, and Dr. Donna Gallo, Middle School Principal. And as I mentioned, before we get to the presentation aspect of tonight, I will go through the format for the Q&A. So please just know that there's going to be a time for anyone who wants to come up and make a comment or ask a question. You'll have that time after the presentation. 
So, with that being said, how did we get here? Well, for the large part of the last year, the district has been engaged in an assessment and evaluation of our educational and operational needs. And with that, we had to consider requests from the community, going back several years, requests to enhance facilities, capital projects that are long overdue, and requests to provide more rigorous programming, specifically in the area of STEAM. And we're gonna talk a lot, about, lot more about STEAM and the benefits and how we plan to implement that program. So when it comes to this bond issuance, there's three separate distinct categories that need to be focused on here. First of all, it's gonna be the longstanding capital projects that many of you that have been in this community have talked about for a long time. HVAC at the middle school comes to mind. Long overdue, and certainly an improvement there will improve the educational environment for many, many students. Second, you're gonna hear similarly improvements to facilities for our athletics and extracurriculars. And Tatlock Fieldhouse comes to mind. Talked about for many, many years. Much needed, long overdue. And again, definitely our students will benefit who use those spaces. And thirdly, you're gonna hear about facility enhancements that go hand in hand with our educational programming, our STEAM initiative. And again, we'll talk about the importance of that, but it's important to understand that those facility enhancements are needed at the high school and middle school level to do this program, to take on this initiative. It's essential, it's critical. That's one of our challenges. You're gonna hear later about our board goal related to STEAM. It's a multi-year plan that we've been working on and we're excited. We've made a lot of headway so far. Moving into next year with our initiative for grades one through five, we'll be establishing STEAM innovation labs in all of our elementary schools with a designated teacher to give our students exposure and access at the elementary level. But part of this plan is to move that up into the middle school. So, so sincerely, invest in a lot more programming and experiences at the middle level, which is critical to catapult students into the high school level that'll give them experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have many times until they reach college. And we're gonna talk again about the big picture vision when it comes to those things. So with that being said, I am going to turn it over right now to business administrator, Derek Jess. Good evening, everybody. Oh, got to adjust this. I'm not as tall. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out and listening to our information that we're going to give you on our planned bond issuance. So, what is a bond? The easiest way to think of it is similar to the mortgage that you have on your home. It's a loan that you've taken out to purchase a piece of property or to do enhancements to property that you already own. And for a school district, the only way that we can fund major projects is through a bond. So, the city will issue a bond and the district will receive those funds to move forward with whatever the planned activities are that we need. And then as we repay that, we not only repay the principal, but similar to a mortgage, we also pay interest on that, which goes to the investors who have purchased those bonds. So some of you may be saying, well, why do we need a bond? Why can't we include it in the overall operating budget? So the operating budget is used to fund the daily operations of the district. So it's used to pay the salaries of our staff. It's used to pay for their benefits. It's used to purchase the supplies and the textbooks that the students need. It's used for professional development and the district insurance benefits such as workers' compensation and property and casualty. However, we are limited to a 2% tax levy cap by statute, which means that the amount that the taxpayers provide to the Board of Education to help fund our budget cannot exceed 2% in any one year. So in actuality, for the year going to be, that's going to begin July 1st of 2022, 2% represents $1.3 million. So you'll see as we get to the numbers of this that $1.3 million would not come anywhere near what we need for the, for the renovations and the additions that we are proposing. Secondly is a capital outlay budget. Capital outlay is typically used where the district will purchase equipment, whether it's equipment for students or equipment for maintenance and custodial staff and also to fund smaller projects that we utilize our capital reserve funds for. Now, capital reserve funds are monies which the district has saved over time, and it's usually, sur usually surplus, and we take a portion of that and deposit it into our capital revenue fund, so that way as we move forward, we can plan and say, okay, next year we know that we're gonna have to replace windows in one of our schools, and that's gonna cost $500,000, and if we have it in that fund, that's what that would be used for. And lastly is our capital projects fund. That's where 
funds for the bond proceed will be deposited and that's what that fund is typically used for for all your large scale projects and investments so some of the history of the district bonding so in 2014 the district's total debt was just over 54 million dollars and that was all of the bonds that had been issued up to that point including a 2011 issuance of $19.5 million. And our net debt percentage was 19.7%. And what that means is the amount of debt we had outstanding that we still owed to the people that invested in us over the total amount that the district was able to borrow. And that's how we came up with that number. So under 20% really is not that bad of a number. The total amount that we are proposing now is $37,429,555 to accomplish everything that we're going to be speaking about this evening. And if that is moved forward, that would put our total debt at fit just under $57,200,000, and our total debt percentage would be 19.05%. So even though the 57 million is a little bit more than the 54 from eight years ago, our net debt percentage would be a little bit less. And we also issued in, 2011, in 2016, $13.8 million worth of bonds. And those bonds, both the 2011 and the 2016 issue, were used for renovations to the auditorium that you're sitting in now, as well as the middle school auditorium, for new boiler replacement here in the high school, for emergency generators at the high school and at the middle school, for an addition to Jefferson and Franklin and for site work at Lincoln, and also for mechanical upgrades at the middle school. So those funds were used for those purposes. <clears throat> so we put a quick slide together here to give you an idea of everything that's in this bond, this package. If you can take a look at the middle school, we're talking about adding two additional classrooms for our program enhancements and educational STEAM uh, instruction as well as improving the concourse area, which is now currently used by students to eat lunch. If you've ever been in the middle school recently, they have the original cafeteria and then that L-shaped where they have to overflow, not conducive to what should be for a public school in Summit. Um, so that room would be converted into more uh, computer labs and innovation space, as well as you see there the installation of HVAC, very much needed. People will be supporting that much, much more in the coming weeks for sure. Um, and then you talk about converting some auxiliary space behind Muller's Gym. Um, the building being 100 years old, there's some storage space back there that actually when we walked it, we probably don't want to go back there again until it's renovated because it's so old. But it's useful space that we can turn into a wellness center, which will definitely alleviate some pressure in our physical education classes and give our unified PE program uh, a space of their own. Um, and of course, if many of you may not know, the main entrance of the uh, middle school as it currently sits, was not the original main entrance. So the entrance now needs a sort of a tennis desk security vestibule where our security guard is there where they receive and accept students for pick up and drop off and attendance purposes as well. And so at the middle school, the addition, which will encompass a lot of this, is gonna be about 7,000 square feet. Moving on to the high school, you see that we're proposing a second floor addition to the media center for the STEM labs. Uh, we're going to move the TV studio, control room, and edit rooms into the media center, and we're going to turn the existing television studio into a much-needed classroom. We're going to also have collaborative and individual study spaces as well as additional classroom space, and a dance studio and renovation of the choir and drama classroom spaces, which will actually increase that space by about 700 square feet. Also, we're going to um, upgrade Tatlock Fieldhouse, as Mr. Huff said, and also the lower field at the high school, as well as put a prominent facade on Morris Avenue so that everybody realizes as you drive by that this is Summit High School. And so now moving into the costs. So 37429555 is the total, and that's broken out as capital improvements. So that would be the installation of the heating and air conditioning over at the middle school, the cafeteria expansion, and the expansion and construction of the security and attendance area for $9 million. Brayton School is in desperate need of new windows and also steel lintels, which is the framing above the window because that is in uh, serious need of repair, and that'll be $2.3 million. Moving on to athletics and extracurricular. So for the lower field renovation and the uh, construction of a facade, 
for the renovation of the Tatlock Field House and also for the renovation of the middle school field, which will still remain a natural grass field, but it will also include a four lane synthetic track as well as uh, a field for soccer and field hockey and three smaller fields for t-ball, baseball, and softball. So those three together will be just under $7 million. And then for the educational programming, in the middle school, the construction of the STEAM labs is part of the addition, the upgrade of the technology education rooms, the construction of the wellness center behind Muller's gym, and also small group instruction room, $7.77 million. And here in the high school, the media center addition for the STEAM labs, moving of the TD studio, the collaborative study rooms, upgraded common area, and the dance theater and chorus room for $11.3 million. So when you put all those things together, that's how we come up with the $37 million addition and renovation budget. And now I'll turn it back over to Mr. Huff. So you can see with the three separate categories and you break it out that way, it's really a, a comprehensive plan to address past needs, current needs, and future needs as it relates to facility and educational programming. And we talked about the STEAM initiative, and we're going to hear a little bit about it from Jen McCann, our Director of Education, as a board goal and the steps that we've taken to develop a multi-year plan. Um, but certainly I want to share that Summit Public School's vision for the future of education is student-centered and based on student achievement. And yes, we all know that that means a rigorous instruction in math, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, so that arithmetic and the sciences, but we also know it's much, much more than that. Uh, the, the world has been changing at such a rapid pace prior to the pandemic, and we're gonna even accelerate it that much more coming out. We're already seeing how industry is adapting to connecting with people from further distances as a result of coming out of this pandemic, new technologies that are needed. And along with that come the new skills that are needed for people to succeed and compete, for our students, our children to succeed and compete in that future world. Cutting edge public education requires a multidisciplinary approach, many disciplines with interdisciplinary learning opportunities. That's gonna give our students the skills that they need to compete. Those are skills like inquiry, collaboration, discussion, problem solving, critical thinking. That's what STEAM is going to give us. And I wanted to make sure that we put a stamp on that and say before we move into the rest of the presentation that that's what this board is committed to, that's what we are committed to as educators, and that's what forward thinking has gotten us to be successful to this point for Summit Public Schools. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen McCann. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and just to echo some of the sentiments um, from Mr. Huff regarding STEAM education, STEAM education is an approach to teaching and learning that combines science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics to help guide our students' inquiry, discussion, and problem solving. Education experts say STEAM education is about more than just developing practical skills alone. It also helps students develop the capacity to take thoughtful risks, engage in meaningful learning activities, become resilient problem solvers, embrace and appreciate collaboration, and work through the creative process. STEAM empowers our students to be curious learners who seek creative solutions to questions that they can't just Google, and instead lead our students to develop the soft and hard skills necessary to succeed in college and in their careers. It's up to schools at this point to ensure that students are equipped with the necessary tools for the undefined careers that they will encounter as they graduate high school. It is important more than ever that our students and our future leaders develop the knowledge and skills to solve real world problems, have the capacity to make sense of information, and know how to gather and evaluate evidence to make informed decisions. And students can do exactly that with a high quality STEAM education. Um, so with that being said, the district this year had a goal centered around STEAM education and looking at our current programming and expanding it at all levels. 
We created a district-wide STEAM committee at the beginning of the school year comprised of elementary teachers, administrators, middle school teachers, supervisors, high school teachers, and administrators from both the secondary levels. That committee worked at looking at our current programming from three different lenses. We looked at programming, facility needs, and also personnel needs. While designing and looking at our programming, they really wanted to ensure that we took everybody's needs in mind and offered something for everyone. So we created and proposed a comprehensive K through 12 program. And that program is starting at the elementary levels with the expansion of the pilot program that Jefferson's been running for the past five years to all of our elementary schools in the upcoming school year, um, as well as some programs that will be offered or new courses that will be offered at the high school for September as well. But we really wanted that elementary experience to cultivate that interest in learning in STEAM and provide those different opportunities then taking that option and exp allowing exploratory options at the middle school level in order to springboard them into high school courses which are more specific where they can then take a specific track into a particular area or multiple areas Hello, everyone. Um, so with what you see here is a presentation of the vision that we've developed for the middle school cycle program. Um, and so we're really excited about that. There were so many individuals um, that helped come together to really develop this program. And the middle school model, as Jen mentioned, is an exploratory model. So we are looking to provide our students with exposure and as much opportunities in a variety of interests that we can offer them. And so with this vision, um, we're looking to expand those offerings. So currently in the middle school, students take four cycle classes per year. Um, this vision allows for students to take six cycle classes per year. So we're taking courses that we currently run and enhancing them, and then we're also adding new courses to this. Um, so as you can see, there are several new courses um, that are proposed here. And with these new courses, we're really looking to take some of those intro level classes that students take at that high school level and have those classes um, be positioned in the eighth grade, which further allows for the expansion of the high school program and students being able to advance in those areas um, much more than they would have. Um, so but again, I'll show you next gen, sorry. Um, so again, we're really excited about this and this is something that we really feel you know, passionate about and excited to be able to offer all of these opportunities to our students. So if looking at the current slide, um, we, as we mentioned, we're really looking to offer something for everyone. So our committees comprise that programming in four different areas, fine performing and practical arts, robotics and computer science, technology education and engineering, as well as science. The classes or courses that you see um, listed in white are currently the courses that we offer in these different areas and at the middle school and high school level. And those that are um, written in blue would be our new offerings. I would like to highlight um, in the science area to take the opportunity, although you only see two um, courses listed at the high school level and they're written in white, we do offer 18 elective courses um, at the high school level, but these two particular courses would be the two courses that would be moving into the new facilities and the reason these two courses were selected are because of the type of activities um, and curriculum that go along with these two courses. Uh, we need a bigger facility in order for us to enhance the programming and options that we can provide our students. Um, I'd also like to highlight um, within the middle school setting and the high school for fine performing and practical arts, um, moving video production down to the middle school or offering a video production course will allow us new opportunities at the high school level um, and also adding more media arts um, requirements that are required by the state in terms of the t our New Jersey student learning standards.
lead a bit? Before we move on, I wanted to comment on this slide. This is really a powerful slide. If you really take a look at this and break out the categories and underneath the STEAM umbrella and take a look at all the course offerings that we're proposing, this is really going to be where our students are going to act, acquire those skills that they need by engaging in this. And when you take a look at the computer science, the state is really talking about um, more standards and more assessments related to computer science because that is one part of the, the field that is just exploding moving forward when it comes to coding and computer science. And the jobs that exist for our students out there when they graduate, some of them may not exist right now. We know that. We've seen that to be a, a pattern. So this is really exciting stuff. A lot of hard work went into this and forward thinking. To give you an idea about um, what we're going to realize from the construction from this bond, this is a picture real quick of the middle school. This is the cafeteria area. The kitchen is currently here. We would reposition it over here. We would realize a one-room cafeteria style so that we don't have to have kids spill onto the concourse right here. And then that would be converted into a computer lab or an innovation space. And what that does is gives us the ability to kick out our footprint a little bit and give us a brand new industrial arts room right here, which is currently located on the bottom floor next to the current cafeteria. And then taking a look at this space, I'm sorry, the, the here is the security entrance and attendance desk. And just by this little nook right here, we would actually realize a small group instruction room because that's the bend in the hallway if you're familiar with the, with the area. The second floor, quick look at this, is this is the existing floor plan. Here is where we would be able to kick out and realize two new STEAM labs that are dedicated for those spaces. Again, as Dr. Gallo mentioned, six cycle classes versus floor four. You saw all the new blue courses that would be housed in these rooms, as well as this blue room here. And then for the media center here at this facility, um, Principal Mr. Grimaldi is going to come up and share that with us. Good evening, everybody. So all the programs that we have at the high school would not be able to be implemented without additional space um, in the library. So this is a walkthrough of the library, which is kind of cool. You walk in, the circulation desk would be on the left, the TV studio is that green area, and along the back wall will be your small instructional spaces, and all the library uh, bookshelves will be movable, so the space can be reconfigured for large groups or small groups and for different events that are happening. We uh, vamping the classroom downstairs, and as you walk up the stairs inside the library, on the right-hand side would be a media wall for presentations <clears throat> and for board meetings. And as you go up the stairs, there's four STEAM labs, which would be used for computer program, ro robotics, theater design, animation, and any of the other electives. And they are adjustable to make those spaces reconfigurable for a variety of, of uses. And then outside in the area overlooking the library would be some space for teach students to work collaboratively with each other or small group spaces with teachers. And that sort of gives you an overview of what the library at the high school, which is where the main um, construction would take place here at the high school would be. So what is the process for us to move forward with the bond issuance? So Summit is a type one school district and in New Jersey there are two types. There's a type one and there's a type two. A type one school district has board of education members who are appointed by the mayor. And whenever we need to approve our budget or to pass a bond, what happens is the board of school estimate, which is comprised of members from common council and members from the board of education review, question, and then decide whether or not to approve that. So the first step in the process is the board of education at the June 23rd board meeting will be presented with a resolution to approve this bond issuance and in that resolution with the total dollar amount as well as all the necessary backup information that they need to make an informed decision. If it's successful in passing by the Board of Education, it will then be forwarded to the Board of School Estimate along with the cost and the purpose of need and they will consider approving that as well and that will happen sometime after the June 23rd meeting and hopefully sometime before the middle of July. If the Board of School Estimate successfully approves this, the next step is to move towards the Common Council. Well, they will then review all the information as well, and they have the process of passing a bond ordinance in two readings. So that can happen in July at both meetings, or that would happen in July, and then again in September. So that's the time frame between this June and September for us to hopefully have the approval for this, because the process is gonna take between 18 and 24 months once construction begins. So if we are successful in having this approved by September, between the end of September and January, the plans will be completed, 
the drawings will be completed and we will go out to bid for the project. The bidding will hopefully be completed by March, at which time if we get favorable bids, which everybody knows that in this time that we're dealing with now is up in the air because of the pandemic and supply chain interest, uh, issues and interest rates rising. So if we do happen to get something that's favorable, we would award those bids in time to begin construction in July of 2023 or August of 2023, and then pushing that out to as far as the beginning of the summer of 2025 for construction. And so that is the proposed timeline that we are moving with. We also need to get approval from the Department of Education. And the Department of Education also will provide us, hopefully, with state aid to offset the bonding costs as well. So a portion, a certain percentage, anywhere from 12 to, say, 20 percent, the state would give back to the city to help offset the payment of these bonds as well. Okay, so that's going to take care of the uh, opening and presentation portion of our evening. Uh, we're going to get into our question and answer, our public forum. So I would ask that the panel come and take their seats up front here. We'll introduce ourselves to you. And the way this will work is uh, we have two microphones set up on either side of the aisles here. If you have a comment, question, just feel free whenever you're comfortable to come up, state your name, ask your question. I will turn to the panel for some expert response on that. I may answer something myself. We're here collectively. We're all involved in this process so we can speak to your concerns and questions. Um, if, please, if you do hear your question asked by someone else and you have other questions, just wait and make sure everybody gets an opportunity to that, that, that wants one. Okay. There we go. All right, so we're going to start with introductions. We'll start here in the corner. Thank you, Mr. Ruff. Uh, my name is Dan Healy. I'm the Athletic Director and Supervisor for Health and Physical Education uh, here in Summit. Good evening again. I'm Derek Jess. I'm the School Business Administrator. I'm Doug Ward, District Supervisor of Technology. Stacey Grimaldi, High School Principal. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Forgione, Supervisor of Fine Performing and Practical Arts. Hi, I'm Donna Gallo, Middle School Principal. I'm Tom O'Dowd, Supervisor of Science. Hi, I'm Eric Fontes, Supervisor of Mathematics. Hi, Jennifer McCann, Director of Education. Good evening, Joseph Cordero, Principal of Jefferson Elementary. Hi, Kristen Scaglione Schumann, uh, STEAM teacher at Jefferson Elementary. All right, thank you very much. So who would like to come up first and break the ice? Good thing for a theater code now to use the mic. Good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Matt Lamio. Um, I do many things here at the high school, but most proudly I'm the uh, stage manager for our theater program and secretary elect of our speech and debate team. Um, I first want to say to the board and to our panel that I'm very excited for this proposal. I've been in summer schools all my life um, since first grade at Washington, and I know that this um, board, above all, cares for my success as a student and the success of my peers. Um, I've spent a lot of time, well, I watched the initial proposal, spent time going over the slideshow, and our um, our uh, presentation tonight, and I just want to say, as much as I'm excited for all these new um, innovations, even though I might not be able to experience them myself, I just want to make the board aware, um, from a student's perspective, and on behalf of our performing arts programs, that being course, uh, theater, speech, and debate, of which we are known for, um, both state and nationwide, how um, our proposal, mainly to um, renovate the uh, drama room and chorus room, is really depriving um, our program, not just of a house, but of a home. I say that because, um, for my, excuse me one second, I apologize. Um, for the past, uh, for the last 20 years, um, really, um, a lot of our, set, our practices and our collaboration for um, our speech and debate team, our, pra our afternoon practices, preparation for tournaments, as well as rehearsals on the daily for our musical and plays have taken place in room 228. Um, and even besides for our practical means, it served as a, just a community and as a center for all of our performing arts students, myself included, along with many other people, um, as a way to just uh, relax and today, get away from the stress of a regular school life and just enjoy lunch in a space where we feel comfortable to develop as, as uh, students of the performing arts and pursue our passion that okay. has taken us far. So I, just, I want to ask the board just to consider, from the perspective of a student, the practicality and the interpersonal effects of renovating the um, drama room to, uh, to a choir room and to include the theater room and the current choir room, as well as a dance studio. I, um, I understand that there's no malice intended, but I just want to, I would love to communicate with all, any of you more of whoever's um, best fit and just kind of talk about my perspective as a student, as well as everyone else who I'm joined with. Um, in solidarity on a performing arts programs about how we can maybe, I know, to readdress the issue or just kind of engage in a, in a dialogue about how um, 
we may lose and how the success we've enjoyed and, 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 and attending our shows and we're even getting honored right now as we speak through the Montclair State Theater Night Awards and many accolades, um, how that success may unfortunately be hampered with through these proposals. Once again, I mean, no harm and I, and I hope you guys can understand as a student, the, um, how, not for lack of a better term, how scary this proposal may be in terms of my future in the performing arts and our success as a role renowned program. Thank you. Thank you. Before I, well said. And Karen, you certainly can comment, but I'm going to take the first response here. And that is a perfect example of exactly what we do here in Summit and have a young man like that that can stand up and advocate for part of his whole life and his peers and what they benefit from our programming. And our hope, honestly, is to not diminish. We, we echo your sentiment. One of our largest strengths is our debate, our performing arts, our practical arts. I've been to many competitions myself. It's absolutely amazing. It's part of our identity. And our hope is to actually be able to enhance that. Um, we are not in the phase of this project where that we're going to get down to the more specific designs to create that more of a home feel and keep that safe space, but the goal is there to do that. We're actually going to realize a lot larger space for these, for these programs than we currently have, so there's still a lot of discussion that can be had about how to recreate that space, keep that same exact feel, and protect and safeguard everything that you've benefited from and your peers over the years in those programs, because that's important to me, it's important to this board, and it's, it's not going to go unnoticed. Karen? Yeah, I, I would just like to echo with, with uh, what Mr. Huff said, which is certainly not looking to take that away. That's one of the really most important and beautiful things, I think, about performing arts, is that ability to create that safe space and that home feeling for students. And that, that's the last thing that we want to take away. So as we do get into phases where we're looking at what that room's going to feel like, I would welcome student input. You know, we can really, we can talk about that because we want it to continue to be a home and to be, you know, even better, you know. So that, I think that's the intention, and I thank you for speaking to that, because I do think it's important. Sorry, I'm trying to run out too far. Oh, I get it, I get it. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. I know I look totally forward to you guys and talking about this more. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Two mics. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Alex Lefkoff, and uh, Mr. Huff, I want to mirror your comments at the beginning. Um, as a parent, I'd like to thank you and the entire administration, uh, not only for, uh, in my view, a terrific proposal. What you've got here makes a lot of sense, you know, for our kids, for our future. So thank you for your thoughtfulness and putting this in front of us. Um, there's one thing that I'd like to comment on, a question, and, you know, something that I don't see on the list and I'd like your perspective on. And I'm talking about tennis courts. Um, our high school uh, teams practice at uh, Memorial Tennis Courts, and uh, I'm <coughs> real thankful uh, for the city administration for allowing that. Um, however, you know, as an ex-pro tennis player, uh, my view and the view of some of the tennis players in, uh, in our town, uh, the surface of the tennis courts is, uh, is deflated. It is hollow, and uh, it certainly compromises the experience of anyone who plays tennis at the Memorial uh, Tennis Courts. Um, for, for those of you who are not tennis players, uh, playing tennis at Memorial is similar to playing basketball with a deflated ball. Um, so I, I'd love some perspective on whether or not it makes sense to include uh, changes or resurfacing of the tennis courts uh, at Memorial to enhance the experience of our high school uh, tennis players. I think practicing there, bringing uh, teams from other towns to play mm -hmm. in, on our courts, um, in my view, significantly compromises uh, the experience of tennis well. Thank you. And thank you for that. And maybe I can turn to Dan Healy to help me answer that one. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Levkov. We, we spoke earlier today about this conversation. And uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where everything included in this proposal is not an indictment of anything not included in the proposal, of course. Um, and the Memorial Tennis Courts, um, you know, up as we spoke and we'll say publicly too, you know, uh, operated more so by the city, uh, more than any of our facilities, the facilities mentioned in here, and, and we work closely with them and, and the Summit Tennis Association, um, as you and I have discussed today, to try to figure out what's next for these facilities and always improving them. 
As we mentioned, the, the vast improvements made to the Tatlock tennis courts, which needed those recently over the past couple of years, um, and what's next for Memorial. And, and both you and I discussed kind of finding out what's next and, and our partnership with the city about what the future holds for Memorial tennis courts, because as you had said, it's great that we have all those courts there, eight courts, not every high school program has the opportunity to compete on those eight courts. And uh, um, again, hopefully, you know, the future holds uh, improvements for them, but um, as we said, not, not a part of this proposal at the moment, um, and we'll look down the road. And you know, one of the, the best things about Summit is we do have a great relationship with the city and the joint usage of fields and space for our athletics and our youth sports. Um, so this could be something we can continue to look at. There may be something in our operating budget that we can contribute. There are other groups. This middle school field that is proposed in this has been discussed for many years by various youth groups and, and groups in town with the joint fields of, uh, of Summit. So there's other ways that we can continue to explore this and understanding that it's important to, to other people as well. Yeah, no, uh, I appreciate it, in, in Mr. Kelly. Thank you for you know the feedback before and feedback now. Uh, I'd love to continue engaging in this conversation. I mean, given the length of this you know time these projects take, it might be two to three to four seasons until you know the entire community and tennis community will ex you know experience any of these improvements. Uh, so I'd love to um, you know engage after this conversation and proactively. So you know this is not something we can let go after this conversation. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Campbell. I've been a Summit resident for about 12 years or so. Um, I am the current president of Summit Soccer Club. We uh, have been involved with the club for about 10 years, been a board member for about six years. Um, just by way of uh, some numbers, back in 2010, Summit Soccer Club had 447 players. As of this year, we have 993. Um, we got a lot of kids playing soccer and and we're not the only club that is, that is growing significantly. We have, I'm sure some of the lacrosse club, if anybody's here, could get up and talk about how many more children are playing with lacrosse, basketball, the flag football program is growing. Um, you just talked about the joint fields. I'm wondering if, like with other fields in town, if these youth programs that are feeding the success of the high, at the high school level, if we will have an opportunity to use both the middle school and the uh, lower high school fields which we're very happy to hear is going to be turf because I see some uh, community program people in the back as well. Scheduling these fields is incredibly, incredibly difficult and to have turf over grass is a huge, huge asset. Um, I don't think I knew that the middle school would remain grass until we were here. Um, this is a very long statement that I just want to have a question because you called it a question and answer. So I already know the question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you going to sit, uh, share the, uh, the athletic fields with the youth programs? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, happy to have you here. Um, as, as you know, uh, you know, and Mr. Oz Ozerowski here from the Department of Community Programs uh, is here and, and he and I work closely, but there is no doubt that conversations about any and all of these athletic facilities and potential upgrades include the youth programs and their usage of those fields. Um, lining, potential lining of a turf field, you know, be a part of that conversation. And as you know, Mr. Campbell, probably better than I do, the, the demand is high. And if you ask someone how many fields the summit needs, the answer is more. Um, so, you know, in terms of what's available and, and additional use, I know demand is already high in those spaces, but um, we may get the question about why turf and or why turf the lower field. And the answer for both fields, both the middle school and the lower high school field, is just more effective or efficient use of it. Maybe not even more, but possibly, um, because the middle school field doesn't drain well, So, and the, and the cinder track is unusable if it rained a day, maybe even two days prior. So to upgrade that facility so that it, it has you know better effectiveness. Uh, and you already mentioned what a turf at the lower field would do and, and the possibility and utility there, and you're 100% right. So. Uh, the demand remains high for space, as you know, in this town for fields and to kind of be better to meet that demand, uh, especially after or during inclement weather, uh, is, is one of the goals here. I know, Mr. Campbell, you're with soccer, but as an example, that middle school field, we spent a lot of time with Summit uh, Junior Baseball because we're going to be able to realize better t-ball spaces in that space for the youth programs that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. So as far as the partnership with the youth programs in town, absolutely, as much as we can. Hi, 
I just have a comment, I don't have a question. My name is Kelly Icavelli. I have been a resident in Summit for over 50 years. Um, I went through the Summit schools and I currently have three children between the high school and the middle school. I'm also a neighbor of Summit High School. I live right across the street. Um, and currently I'm also the president of um, the Summit Lacrosse Club. Uh, first of all, thank you for all your um, work on this, seeing the uh, illustrations outside um, really kind of brought it to life and it uh, looks like an amazing uh, initiative ahead. Um, I'm fully supportive of all the um, initiatives dealing with the fields in town and seeing that the lower high school could be um, a turf will obviously help the high school sports from cancellations, but it will also help the youth um, teams, um, which are drastically shortage uh, field spaces, uh, definitely an issue. Um, as well as when you are down at Tatlock, which is a lot of times the first impression many towns get of Summit when their buses arrive. We have amazing fields, we have amazing tennis courts, and all everything else. It's that field house uh, definitely is an eyesore, so it's nice to see that that will be hopefully uh, upgraded in the near future. But also just want to say thank you for all the work that you're doing and 100% support it. Thank you, Kelly. <coughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Leslie. I live right next to the Summit High School field. My question is gonna be about the signage because we have concerns. Anytime the lower high school field is being used, residents of 412 have to deal with parents parking and picking up their kids in our driveway. They literally block us in and we are not able to enter our own driveway. The question with the signage is gonna be how close is that going to be to 412? And I know I'm only supposed to ask one question, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, if the field is gonna be used more by other parties, will the high school actually help us deal with the problem we currently have? I've reached out to you, Mr. Healy, before about the parking, but mm -hmm. there's no response. Mm -hmm. We just have to call the cops and we have to deal with unable to get into our own driveways. I shouldn't have to sit on Morris Avenue waiting to get into my own entrance because people who are using the field are stopping right in the beginning. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, agreed, and, and that, that's a, a major county thoroughfare that goes through there. And I know right now the rule is that anybody that's using our property, and Mr. Healy can speak to this, they're supposed to park up at the high school parking lot and walk down. Are they doing that? From what I'm hearing from many people over the last several weeks, no, and that's a concern for you. So we would certainly have to partner with the city to make sure. The signage, the facade that we're dealing with is just you know, a, a modern fence. It's not going to be um, blockading people from entering. We do have that access right there on the sidewalk. Our students walk up to school in the morning and, and go home that way in the afternoon. But it would also be a partnership with the city to deal with the traffic and people breaking the law as far as stopping on Morris Avenue to let their kids out. Well, again, from the diagram, it looks like the signage is going to be in between our driveway and the sidewalk you're talking about. Again, that's the concern is if you put okay. that signage right there, Got it. they're going to think that's your parking lot. Got it. Understood. Just understand that these are just basic renderings. No. We haven't settled on that, and if yes. that's a concern and there's a location problem, or even if the sign is not needed and we just need a nicer fence, we'll do that. Yeah. Um, it's really just to give the visual of what our plans are to enhance the area. So there's no commitment to that being right there and next to your property. So the other question I have about the fence, because yep. again, I live at 412. Are you replacing the whole fence around our properties? Because that means the whole trees are going to have to get removed. Or are you just replacing the fence along Morris Avenue? Well, initially we talked about doing it along Morris Avenue. I don't know, we'll have to talk with the architects if there's any need, because there is an existing fence that does go through the trees, but we do not have plans to remove trees in an effort to do that. Okay. Yeah, we do want to keep that natural barrier. Okay, thank you. Hi, David Naidu. Uh, I have two boys. Both of them will be in the high school, which is unfortunate because there seems to be a lot of programs now for the middle school that I would love them to have experienced. Um, so that actually is kind of, I didn't have a formal thought process as far as the question, so I apologize for kind of off the cuff thinking here. But I would like to understand a little bit about the phasing of this. Um, because there is infrastructure that needs to be built and then there's programming. And so is it the idea that the infrastructure first comes and then the programming, or are you planning on starting some of the programming 
uh, while the infrastructure needs to be completed. And, and I think someone commented on phases. Um, is there for the infrastructure, because obviously you're running a school at the same time as you're going to be doing all of this stuff, both these schools, uh, mm -hmm. are we talking about certain projects are prioritized mm -hmm. over other ones? Can you give us a, I know it's still in the initial stages, but if you guys have a sense of where, how things you're planning on rolling them out. Yeah, and I'll, I'll turn to Derek Chess in a minute on that with the construction and how it gets rolled out. But you're absolutely right, Mr. Nader. We, we have infrastructure that is needed to be built in order to enhance the programs, right? We're very limited at the high school and middle school in delivering what you saw as far as program without those spaces. So those spaces do have to come first. We are delivering the programming at the elementary level because we do have the curriculum, the spaces, and the dedicated staff for that. So the timing of that is to roll this up into the middle school next and the high school thereafter as close to possible as each other as possible. The other projects that you see are enhancements to facilities that are needed, the HVAC, you know, the windows and those types of things that I'm not, I know you're aware of the school and operating budget that we handle, but I'll also defer to Derek to help answer your question. So uh, the architects through EI, Mr. Wozni and Ms. Short, have a team of professionals which are developing the plan simultaneously. So it's our hope that all the plans and the schematic drawings will be completed at one time so that way we can go out and bid for all the projects at the same time and then hopefully commence construction sequentially as well so that we are done one right after the other or concurrently. So it's not our goal to say we're going to do this project first and then when this one's done we're going to do this one. It's our goal to try to get all of them started at the same time and again going back to my earlier statement it's really going to depend also on how the funding comes out and how the bids come out because you know as an estimate if we if we say this one project is going to cost five million and the bid comes in at eight million then we're going to have to reject those bids for being over budget and go out and rebid. So that could also prolong the process. But again, it's our hope to make sure we have everything done concurrently. Yeah, that's that's best case scenario. But again, you know, we're we're at the mercy of the climate that we're living in here today, um, and understanding what what it takes for us to get these kind of scope and projects done. I've also been a resident of Summit for four decades, so I have seen the programs grow exponentially just as much as I've seen the traffic on Mars Avenue grow exponentially. And I have the privilege of living directly across the street from the lower field, and I love my view. Um, the current field, the grass field, and I know there's a love of turf, the current field is only treated once a year for chemicals. Now we're talking about putting turf down. And I do have some concerns, um, especially with respect to a drainage issue, because the crumb rubber that's in these, um, in the turf, excuse me, contain contaminants such as lead, benzene, mercury, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, heavy metals, arsenic, and other carcinogenic compounds. My concern is, with this new drainage project, where's that water running off into? I mean, how is that going to compromise the rest of the community? It's, I don't know if anybody can answer that question tonight, but it, it's a valid question. Um, I can echo Leslie's sentiments because she is my neighbor directly across the street. I've seen a pervasive disregard for the parking that is abused at 412 Mars as well as my own building and on the weekends from Norwood to Bedford one cannot see to enter or exit our property safely and I shared with Rob I nearly lost my life a few weeks ago trying to exit my own home you said it to me Tw Mars Avenue is like Route 22 so those are some of the concerns that I have um, <coughs> if they are going to start digging up the field when this initial building was had its first renovation it could have been somewhere in the 90s nobody baited the property so there's that one little hidden component that nobody ever wants to talk about in summit rats they were running up and down Mars uh, not Mars Avenue Kent Place Boulevard at the time I served as board president my condominium and I called the health department I said what do we do they said bait your property so we had to go to the expense to bait the property because it wasn't done and I want to make sure that that's going to be addressed as well whatever 
substance is put down going forward. I've got lots of questions, and I know you don't want to hear them all tonight, but I'm happy to share them with you at work. I can give you my notes. <laughs> Val, <laughs> you have as much time as you need. You I come, come see me. We'll talk. Thank you so much. So, if if I may, yeah. just to answer a couple of your questions, Val. So. I'm going to start in reverse and work forward. So with the rodent problem, I mean, we will work with our district IPM, which is our integrated pest manager, which is Michael Martino, to make sure that we take the necessary precautions in case anything like that does happen. Um, with regards to your first statement about the chemicals and, and the rubber that's utilized, so the, the state has very strict guidelines about what type of rubber can be used in the field. There's also now, there's a new organic rubber if when we met with Bill Edwards, or that is chemical free. So we are going to work with our engineer, Bill Edwards, to ensure that whatever rubber is placed down, that it's not only safe to be played on, but it's also gonna be safe should it run off with the water that comes from the rain and things like that. And he's also gonna design a newer drainage system there, which is going to enhance the drainage on that field to make sure that it is playable all the time. So all the concerns will be dealt with, and as we move forward in this process, we'll make sure that we share them as well so that you're aware. Okay. And Valerie, just to add, just to add on to that, the, uh, if anyone remembers the last iteration of the upper high school turf field, the drainage was not done properly, and Correct. then you had the pellets run off. You had the pellets come. Leslie's parking lot. Yeah. I, I don't doubt it. And the pellets were all over the place because it doesn't drain properly. The pellets mm -hmm. rise to the top, and then there's the runoff. There should be no runoff if drainage is done properly. The pellets should be put, should be sewn in and Im implanted underneath the turf and stay there for the most part if it's drained properly, which is exactly why we had already had the engineer out there to talk about how to potentially do that right so we could avoid all of these problems. Okay. And the only other thing that we, we saw with the iteration of making a facade on Morris Avenue, it's great for people to drive by and say, oh, that is the high school field, but is that going to become the primary drop off and pick up for functions? No. Good. <clears throat> okay. Have a nice evening, everybody. <laughs> I'm a, a neighbor of Val's. I'm on Bedford. I'm Dory Gagnon. Um, so I have a lot of questions and concerns about kind of this whole project, so just bear with me. Um, so there's a lot of building going on in town, and a lot of you may know that, and a lot of you may not be aware of what's going on, but I'm a lifelong resident. I'm also a graduate of Summit along with Kelly, and um, I, I played here on the field. I was a tennis player. Okay, so I have sentiments to that because we were county champs, we won states the next year, as soon as I graduated, unfortunately. But um, I, I, I love those courts down on Tatlock. I, I feel the same way he does about Memorial. I will not play on them. So I know the SDA had some big input about that. You know, it's supposed to be better on your joints and this and that when you're playing. I'm sorry, but when you're an athlete, you wanna play on the real courts. You don't wanna play on these soft rubberized courts um, or you don't play on them at all. Okay, like a real athlete does not play on those courts. We go somewhere else, we find other courts to play on. So I think it's really important. I know, Mark, you probably don't want to hear that from me, but um, it's really important to get the feedback from real pros like him. Um, those courts are, do not work for people to actually play a real match on. So I understand his kids are phenomenal players, are going to do really well. I'm sure his daughter plays and his son's coming up next year. So um, that on the courts. Um, the fields. I am so glad to hear that Tatlock is getting redone. It should have been done right after we graduated because the water is still dripping, same time it was 20 some years ago. So thank you. I hope you guys um, benefit from that. I also really think that we should emphasize the girls utilizing that field um, and that facility a little bit more besides track. Um, I said it when I was there, and now we're in this movement this day and age that I'd really like to see, you know, the lacrosse championship played on you know, that field where the bleachers are packed the stands, and it's not just the parents lined up on the upper high school field. Um, we should be, you know, the women should be given the same rights as the men. So something to think about when we're building this field house, that there should be um, just a little bit more for the girls too. The other thing when we utilize um, Tatlock is that we're always setting up tents and stuff for outdoor festivities, you know, the Friday nights. Um, it would be great to kind of tear down that fence um, that's the walkway right there and just kind of have another space where we can put a gazebo or I know there's a gazebo being built from the Summit Lacrosse Club but something else where you can like put an extended, extendable awning or something um, if it rains and you can have ticket sales there or just 
just thinking where we don't always have to put up the pop-up tents to have sales. Um, we're always trying to figure out a way to, uh, you know, hold kind of outdoor parties. We just had our 50th reunion there. Um, Kelly did a great job, but we're, you know, we're, we're putting stuff all the way down there trying to go around. So that's just another thought when you guys are reworking this Tadlock facility. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, couple concerns is that um, Summit's building a lot in town. Um, there could be another 200 housing units, plus we have a lot of habitats for humanities being built in some townhomes. And I know we've had this, I had this conversation with you earlier, um, but there could be a lot of students coming into the district. I know our numbers are down. I heard kindergarten enrollment is up by like 22 kids, which is great. I know we had an influx of ki people coming in from New York City um, with their families. I think what's happened with this district um, and when we did this renovation years ago, we didn't look on to the future. Um, and we were very narrow-minded and we didn't build on parking then. And I think what you guys have to do, because there's a lot of new board members, is that we have to think to the future. So this is a great project we're doing, but we're not building any additional classrooms onto that. And I think it's gonna hurt us in 10 years or so when we have all these kids coming. And now we're like, uh-oh, we need to add more classrooms. So I think if you're gonna do this multi-million dollar project, it's smart to add a couple extra classrooms if you can, um, to have that extra cushioning, because I don't know what it's like now. I know your numbers, again, your numbers are down. We do this in the cycle, but there's gonna be a peak, and then you're gonna say, why didn't we do that? Just like, why didn't we add on any extra parking years ago, and now the kids have nowhere to park? So I always try to think like, okay, let's look back when we were growing up and how things have changed, and people aren't looking at the big picture. So if you look at the big picture, what we can plan for 10 years from now because you guys might not be here but us residents have been here our whole lives and this is what we're seeing happen mm -hmm. and on bedford especially it's like a nightmare so to the lower um lower turf issue where val we see the overflow of the parking from everywhere and i saw it when oratory was being built and that was our biggest concern you're not putting it on enough parking well guess what they park in front of my house now, with this being built, it's a great sign and everyone's there, but you know, I talked to Mark about it. Mark, what's gonna happen? And it's like, oh, well, they should be parking at the top. I, sh I tell parents that all the time. They have like a three-year-old and a baby in a stroller and they park in front of my house. And I say, you know what? You really shouldn't cross Morris Avenue. And they're like, well, I guess that's my problem. So here they are trying to cross you know, Morris Avenue with kids. And we already had one, one high school kid hit on the corner of Morris and Bedford. So like I'm thinking, okay, my daughter is a sophomore here. We've had we have six kids. I have um, you know one more who's going to be in high school next year. What's going to happen? You know, is she going to be that kid who's like really not paying attention on her phone trying to cross Morris Avenue in the morning, and some other kid's going to hit her? I don't know. But these are things you guys have to think of when we have this huge welcoming sign down there. Um, you know, plan for the the soccer program it's great we all need fields lacrosse i've been coaching with kelly for you know 10 years i've been coaching i get it we all need fields we all want to get our kids out there 24 7 10 days a week right if we had it it would be great we don't have it so what are, what are our options because i don't want to see anybody else get hurt i don't want to see anybody get killed that re 24 accident was bad enough so okay. um those are my concerns <coughs> and i think that's it <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm going to start with a response about the enrollment. <clears throat> yes, our enrollment district-wide is down over the last 10 years, quite significantly. We've been steadily <laughs> declining. Um, we did commission a demographer, and we're doing a study right now to give us our projections for the next five years so that we do better understand if we do need additional classroom space. Um, we don't have those numbers yet. We're going to definitely take a very good, strong look at it. And we are aware of some of the projects in the city that could actually contribute to some of that increase. So it's on our radar. Um, and if there's a need for data, if data comes out and there's a need for us to pivot in some way and be responsible to look forward, we will. Um, right now with this study, it's going to give us five-year projection. Um, and that's basically they go by live birth rates and they go by sales in the community. And that's really where they can pretty accurately project. And beyond that, we have to continue to run these studies to see what it might look like in eight years, ten years. Um, so to just you know, the, I'm not sure the appetite for the board to add space just in case, That's but we do need know. to be I'm prepared that if in the need, we will pivot and, and priorities may shift. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad Was there any comments about the, you know, the traffic or just safety? Just that, that I'm, I'm hearing from the, you know, our neighbors here that uh, it's, it's not necessarily the concern that there's going to be increased issues. It's simply that there is an issue and any kind of proposed 
renovations or, or reimagining of that space down there don't help those issues. Um, so as we kind of continue with, uh, you know, hopefully we move along in the process, these are obviously the major concerns that we, you know, what can we do as part of this process to help solve that issue and certainly not make it worse, so. Well, no, if I can just uh, go on that a little bit. I mean, you guys didn't, <coughs> not you guys per se, but like um, someone didn't build enough parking for here, so the kids were all scrambling around. It was like, you know, where do I find a spot, right? So they were on every side street possible. So then we have to go to the city and we have to put up an ordinance on the, on the street so they can't park. So I went to um, uh, Officer um, Daly and I had a discussion with him and he said, well, if there's a problem, you put up another ordinance. So it's like, if there's constantly a problem, we have to deal with it. It's like, so then there's gonna be a permanent no parking sign in front of my street. It, and I, did, I bought my house, there was no school across the street. My Bedford Road was quiet. I didn't have all this. There's so much traffic I can't even get out of my driveway. So it's like, okay, you build it, it's my problem. And I, I think we have to come to a realization in this town that like, as taxpayers, we don't have a say anymore of what's going on, but let's try to, before there's a problem, let's see if we can fix it so we're all not impacted because we're the ones who've lived here our whole lives. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think, I really appreciate you guys having this meeting. It really means a lot to a lot of us, especially me, that we can have this open dialogue. So thank you. I hope it's not coming across too harsh, but I just, mm -hmm. I want you to take that into consideration that, you know, these, you know, affect and cause relationships always affect the people who are living here. So, Understood. Thank, thank you. you. Can I also ask for the neighbors as well, just to clarify, we're talking <coughs> predominantly Saturday mornings or weekend mornings. Is that accurate? Saturday and Sunday. Which, which is, uh, is it also weekdays as well? Weekdays, weekdays, yeah. okay, weekdays. thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Beatty, and I have the good fortune of um, having a senior that's graduating this year, so all this will be passed. But, um, but I, uh, I actually would like to go back to high school with all that's going on here, so it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, just a very basic question around the bond issuance. Um, is there any opportunity for capital funds to be raised by the community separate from issuing a bond? So assuming that you, you, get, you have the bond issued and there's no problems, but there's a, is there a way to defray that cost by getting private donations to name, name rights and things of that sort? Absolutely, we're, we're more than open to anybody and any entity, whether corporate or personal, that would like to donate money. If, if we happen to get funds before the bond, we can utilize, utilize those upfront. If we happen to get funds after the bonds are issued, those funds would be returned to the city so that that can be used to pay down the debt. So is there anybody working on that? As of this point, no. We, we've started to look for grants, not personal donations or corporate donations, we started to work with um, Sustainable Jersey to help see if what funding is available for HVAC, roof, windows, and things like that. But we have been talking about it, we just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, I think that's a worthy endeavor because Absolutely. I think there's plenty of people in this community that would enjoy passing it forward and I think it's worth the opportunity. Thank you. And, and I'll give you a perfect example of that is the elementary STEAM initiative right now, thanks to the generosity and support of the SEF we would not be able to be doing what we're doing next year without their contributions. Hi, good evening. My name is Melissa. I have two children in, uh, at Brayton. Um, 
So I know this is not exactly the format, you know, to talk about the plans. It's more about the bond issuance. But I wanted to make sure that there'll be another hearing to, for, for the community to talk more about the actual plans themselves, um, because there's a lot of concern here about the plans, and I think there'll be more community-wide, just more um, feedback and more input. Um, and my question is about resilience and sustainability. Um, because it may have been addressed in other ways, but you know, I know we started this year with a major flood at Brayton. Um, you know, there's predictions. The state is seeing flooding in places we've never seen it before. Um, you know, we talked about the field that has drainage issues. So I'm wondering if district wide, you know, there have been considerations about things like. Um, you know, flooding, energy, you know, is there any plan for any sort of, I know some of the schools have backup generators, but, you know, generally how are we accessing um, energy in uh, emergency situations? Um, you know, is there any backup grid or solar or anything like that um, in the plans? And um, with another question along yeah. those lines. But I mean, if anyone has an answer to that. I'm uh, sure, so about 10 years ago, the district did do a survey with regards to solar power. And at that time, it wasn't deemed feasible to do it. However, we have started to look into that again. Um, and we do have between uh, EI and between Bill Edwards Engineering, we have them going through all of our schools to look and see how can we mitigate flooding. We've worked with FEMA because of Hurricane Ida to see what can we do so that doesn't happen there again. And we are going through all the schools building by building. As Mr. Huff said earlier, we have done a comprehensive study of all of our facilities to see what could go into this particular bond. But we are looking as well at the drainage issues uh, for roofing, for gutters, and for sustainable energy. Yeah, we, we had probably two major floods at Brayton in the last 10 years, obviously this past year, very devastating. And we immediately have our engineers out there with, um, with, with solutions for now and for long term, including the drainage off the roof, the water flow on the ground level, and anything that we can do to eliminate that from happening again. We're in the process. I'm glad to hear that. And then the, the last thing was um, one thing that's very much in the pipeline for the state is electric school buses. And so different districts are already thinking about the infrastructure for that, the charging stations. Um, and I know that money has to come into the district, but it is coming to the state, right, uh, for electric school buses and charging infrastructure. Was that considered all in these plans? Um, not necessarily financially, but that, you know, eventually we'd need to have room for Right, so for that. not with this particular project. However, I do know that the federal government, I think gonna give New Jersey about $500 million with, for this particular purpose, and we have started to talk about it. Uh, we don't really have a large bus fleet. I think we have three buses, but we do have some maintenance vehicles as well. So if it makes fiscal sense to do that, then that is something we would seriously consider. I know I have some constituents in other districts who just purchased um, two 54 passenger school buses that are electric at a cost of $350,000 per school bus. And right. that's almost triple the cost it of is. a gasoline right. school bus. Right. So, but the well, savings not, well, is long term. <laughs> exactly. So we are going to consider that as we move forward. And once the application comes out from the state for us, we're, we're going to review that to see can we you know, apply for it and how will that benefit us. Thank you. I did hear we can retrofit the gas engines for the low cost of $175,000 per bus. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. I am Mitchell Hecker. I'm the incoming president of SPARC, the Summit Performing Arts Resource Committee. For those in the audience who do not know and for those viewing around the world, think of us as the booster club for the performing arts in our school system. Collaboration, creativity, and excellence are the cornerstones of our performing arts community in Summit. Throughout this last year, hundreds of our kids in the elementary schools, our middle school, and here in our high school have created more than a dozen full productions, shows, appearances, and presentations. Almost 40 
nominations have been earned by our high school and middle school at the Paper Mill Playhouse Rising Star Awards and the Montclair Theater Awards were being presented as we speak. Similarly, 12 of our most qualified orators have reached the national championships in speech and debate and will be there in Louisville, Kentucky, representing our high school. If we are going to be proud of them, we should be grateful for all of us that are here tonight. From the families that support these kids at home, to the parent organizations, to our school administrators, and our Board of Education. We have a lot to be grateful for. It's why we choose to live here. This bond referendum speaks to STEAM. And most of it, the large majority of it, goes to educational purposes. Parentheses, as it should. But there's money for athletics, and there's money for the arts. So in the near future, there will be a dance program at our high school to stand right beside the choral, music, and theater programs. Our marching band on the turf field that we all think of as athletic will give our marching band the opportunity to rehearse with greater precision than ever because of the lines on the field, their routines. We are adding a theatrical tech program set for those students who don't want to be on stage but would rather be in the crew behind the stage or up in the balcony over there. They will have an opportunity to learn their craft. And by the way, you couldn't pick a better person than Jason Orby to lead that. And if we're going to think of the arts, it's only fair that we think of the creative arts through technology that are going to be driven by this bond proposal. The ability to create in the fields of robotics and game design and animation. That being said, <laughs> I trust in all of us together and in the individual conversations that I've had with some of you tonight and before tonight that we can recognize the need to collaborate on some very important issues to the Performing Arts Community and Summit. First, there is a dearth of space here in the high school for our costume and set shops. There is a need to expand and modernize how those spaces get used beyond what some Boy Scout does for his Eagle project. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> and there needs to be a cost effective and efficient way, a more efficient way for the middle school, Dr. Gallo, and the high school to store the costumes, props, and sets from previous shows. I'm not gonna do this justice the way Matt Lamio did. And I wasn't gonna say this, it's not in my little cards. But I am going to take a beat, if you don't mind, to say something a little bit more personal. I've watched the performers and the speech and debaters here at the high school for three years. The space that they call home, the theater room, is everything a home should be. It allows all of our high school students to express themselves as individuals to be embraced for the unique qualities that they all carry. The typical thing about all of them is that they're all atypical. And when they walk through the door of their theater room that has been built and established over 20 years, they leave on the outside any judgment or self-consciousness. But when they step inside, it unleashes the creativity 
the improvisation, the collaboration of everything that we want them to aspire to. So I don't know what the numbers are. And I've said this privately, and I've joked that I would never say it publicly, but I'm going to say it publicly. <laughs> I don't care what the numbers are. I know there are measurements and budgets and floor plans and this room going here and there. The most important thing to these kids is that it's home in the spirit and in the meaning that they carry, not us. So as you, we all deliberate over their home, aside from the numbers, I ask on behalf of them that we truly collaborate together on making their space as meaningful as possible because that's what they've come to expect and deserve so much. If we're going to have a tech theater curriculum, we might as well give them the best sound and lighting system we can. I know it's been talked of, but it's another thing for us to collaborate on. And finally, for our elementary schools, it has been far too long that the infrastructure of stage and lighting has been paid attention to. And so representing the children that begin their performing arts careers, we hope that we can collaborate on improving the infrastructure at our elementary schools. Collaboration, creativity, and excellence. This is a collaborative community. We wouldn't live here if it wasn't. And representing Spark and the performing arts students and families, we look forward over this next year, starting after tonight, if not right now, in creatively presenting and expanding on all of the opportunities that are in front of us and our kids. Because there is no doubt that given the opportunity, given the resources, our kids in speech and debate, in theater, in music, soon to be dance, I will put this city and this community up against any in the state, if not the region, if not the country and they deserve everything that we can imagine on their behalf. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, I don't have quite as much of a speech prepared. That was amazing. <laughs> Uh, I'm Sue Flannery Huffman. I have a student here at the high school and a student at Franklin. Um, I thank you. It's very exciting to see the district thinking strategically. Uh, I'd say we're very excited about the STEM plans. I had specific questions related to the athletic plans and to the performing arts space plans. Um, related to the athletic plans, um, with the lower high school field, I wonder if there's any intention to add a baseball field in the corner and if there's any intention to add lights. Certainly not lights, but I'll defer to Mr. Healy. <laughs> the uh, current configuration down there uh, in terms of the softball field that exists is probably going to maintain. I don't know if we would put permanent mound and line it for baseball. Softball itself there would not be able to play, be played at the high school level because it's just it's too small. It doesn't fit in there. It currently doesn't get played there. Um, so any softball or diamond space that would be there or remain there uh, from the high school perspective would be purely practice and from the Summit Junior Baseball level would be a softball offering at the most. If there was kind of temporary lining and temporary pitching mounds that they would be interested in putting in, I'd, I'd be open to that discussion, of course. I think we all would. Um, but uh, in terms of the softball or adding a baseball field, it, it would, for, for upper grades and older levels, it would simply be a practice space anyway. And the, uh, just to add, for, while we're talking baseball, softball, uh, I know Mr. Huff mentioned this, the middle school is going to be uh, adding a small baseball slash t-ball space to it, again, not helping 
necessarily the high school program, but they're adding an additional t-ball space going from one to two. Um, in talking with our high school softball and baseball coaches, the prospect of even having a space to practice down there, where at turf, um, is really exciting to them, even mm -hmm. if games couldn't be added. It also, and maybe Coach Walsh wants to plug his ears, but it also could be a space where we could then move a high school softball or baseball game to the upper turf and have our lacrosse program move down to the lower turf. Okay, he can open up his ears now. <laughs> Thank you. And then related to the performing arts space, um, it certainly sounds exciting and I did hear you say it was going to be 700 square feet more space. I'm wondering if that's the rooms themselves or that includes the senior lounge and the hallways that they use to you know, rehearse and you know, do some things because that, I think with the space, I think you know, when I hear my daughter talk, it, it's not just the rooms, it's the entire space and the way it's configured and the proximity of different spaces to each other and to teachers when they're in and out of rooms. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we're thinking more broadly in terms of all of the space they currently use, not just the rooms that are designated for chorus and drama. Do you want to answer? Yeah. Do you want to answer? Well, I, I was just going to say that's definitely something I've been thinking about. In fact, the proximity of the uh, theater dance studio to our new theater tech studio and the lounge space outside was part of the consideration of exactly what you're saying. I believe the additional square footage is classroom only, not, not taking into consideration those lounges. But we do know the students use those spaces for breakout rooms, for rehearsals, and all of that. So that, that proximity piece that you spoke to is definitely something we're thinking about. And not, yes. and not reducing that outside space in the right. upstairs senior lounge. And just keeping it continuous. Keeping it intact. Yeah. It's just the current chorus room and health classroom would, the current health classroom would be reduced, uh, chorus room would be reduced for that hallway going up to that second area, but that becomes one larger space there. For that would be the dance and um, theater space, mm -hmm. and then chorus would go into 228. So it's basically just a flip-flop of those two spaces, still staying within the same proximity of each other, just flip-flopping a little bit, and not changing, and I say changing space, the, student, the space would still be available for students to have lunch in, to be there after school, to, ha to be, have that home. It would just be a new four walls. We'd still work with the staff in terms of bringing memorabilia to those spaces, making sure it felt comfortable working with the students to make sure they still felt like it was home for them and a safe place for them as well. But it will be a combined theater and, dra or a combined drama and dance room? It is, because right now theater, our drama program, our theater classes are only offered in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So that space is actually not used in the morning at all. So the plan would be using that space in the morning for classes for dance. So then dance leaves in the morning, theater's there in the afternoon, and then after school, the space still exists for the theater programs to use as well. Or for practice space, for plays or, or the musical or things mm -hmm. like that, or, or debate. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Carrie Witcher. I have uh, two sophomore um, girls of high school and a sixth grader. Um, one of my sophomores is passionate about dance, um, and I just wonder why we would have to wait uh, for two years to get a dance program started. Maybe there's some space that we could start next year or in the fall. Uh, we, we don't really have a space in the building, and, and Ms. Grimaldi, maybe you can speak to this more too, that would lend itself to dance just because of the size of the space and the need for potentially a sprung floor, bars, mirrors, and all of that to make it the safest space possible for students. Um, so we really want to, that to be in place so that we can start it um, and get even after school our students who rehearse for the musical and they use the lobby space and the hallway space, get them out of those public spaces and into a true studio space. And then other spaces in the building, besides the theater room not being used in the morning, we really, I'm gonna say there's no room at the end. Um, basically there are periods during our day where we have no available classrooms, additional space available for, for, uh, for classes to be held. So. Could you use the stage? This is actually used 
periodically throughout the day for a variety of things, speakers for classes. Um, we have our course program and our band and our orchestra practice here as well when they do combined rehearsals before concerts or before events. And then also the sets for the plays and, um, and the musical. So it, the space, although it is an awesome space to have, it's used enough throughout the day that we could not dedicate the space alone for a class. Okay, um, just another aside, but um, I've, I've been looking into floors for my daughter's dance studio as well, and they make those squares, just like the carpet squares mm -hmm. for the dance and for the room that the dance studio was only three thousand um, dollars and so I don't know you might consider something like that in the interim um, I don't know for something after school or something like that thank you yes I, I've uh, <clears throat> called deep Singh. I'm a summit resident I have two children that play all sorts of sports one of those sports is uh, wrestling and uh, you know, for the parents that have children that are uh, in uh, in wrestling, they'll tell you uh, we often uh, lug our kids around to Chatham, New Providence, and other towns that I really don't know. But uh, <laughs> you know, one thing we don't have is uh, a home here for wrestling. Uh, is there anything in the budget or any plans to build uh, a wrestling room? I think it'd be great for the community, for the parents, for the, for the children. I know that team isn't big enough, and I know we combine it with Chatham. But that's probably because we don't have a place to a place to practice. The kids don't have a place to go. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, th I, it's uh, it's at least a chicken or the egg argument, right? In terms of having the space and the facilities for a team, and then allowing the team space to grow. Um, a wrestling room was in some of the conversations about this, and I've talked with our res our high school wrestling coaches about it, and and that remains even if. If it's not a part of the current iteration of this bond proposal, it remains uh, a conversation. Ms. Grimaldi and I have had the uh, other district leadership to try to get them a home that is a permanent home, or not a permanent home, but a dedicated home for them um, in this building or around here. So that remains, um, you know, regardless of the fate of this bond proposal, uh, remains a target for my department uh, to try to um, get them that space. Because I, I agree with I agree with what you're saying. As of, as of now, it's, it is not in the proposal, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So uh, right now, I think we're, do you know what is in the proposal? Right now, I think the parents are rolling up the mats, putting them away, this and that, and it's, it's, a, little, it's a lot, and it takes away from practice time and what have you. Is there, is there anything that you can tell us that, that has been proposed? Are, are, you, are you saying the parents are rolling up the mat for the youth programs, you're saying? That, well, uh, youth programs, whatever, uh, my, my children are 12 and 10 years old, so I guess the youth, I don't know for, uh, for high school, but uh, for definitely for the youth, youth they are. Uh, that takes about 15 minutes to, you gotta either get there early or stay later, 15, 20 minutes, everybody's putting, putting the, the, the energy. Uh, we you know, practice at the cafeteria or uh, whatever after, uh, you know, the, the, the gym with the basketball courts and what have you. Uh, so it's, it's a lot for the parents, uh, and it takes away uh, significantly from the from practice time for the kids. Yeah, the, for, for most wrestling matches, there are very few schools that have dedicated match facilities. Well, where, for, for, practice. for practice, practice, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, were, were we to be able to address that, or hopefully when we're able to address that, it's probably going to be a multi multi-use facility anyway, where even at the high school level, mats would have to be rolled in and out. You know, ideally not in the cafeteria, to your point, um, but even if they had a dedicated space, it wouldn't just be exclusively used for after-school wrestling in the winter. It would, be, it would be still be multi-purpose, but to your point, it'd be dedicated for them in their season with mats not having to be rolled around, with mats not having to maybe go up and down each day in a cafeteria. So there would be, you know, ideally when we get to that point, hopefully we do very soon, a space for them, but there would still be a function of setting up, just like our volleyball teams have to set up nets every day, the nets don't stay up. Um, so there's a setup that goes into it, but to your point, hopefully one with a dedicated space that would be streamlined so that we're not, you know, so that, that, that time can be minimized. And just to piggyback on that, as you heard me say earlier in the presentation, we went through many drafts of this bond issuance, 
and we had a lot of conversation about the wrestling room. And as we move things around, try to realize where we could put that space as a dedicated practice space or a multi-purpose area. And it just, with the limited footprint that we have right now, it wasn't in the cards for us to build additional extension of a footprint just for the wrestling room at this point. So we're gonna continue to explore that. We understand it. We had a lot of conversation about it. We know that's a need for our school. Also a wrestling parent, and uh, I, I know you guys have put a lot of time into this. I really appreciate it, and I like how open that you guys are to different ideas, collaborating with others, and also indicating that uh, you know that you're not quite finalized on everything, and that there's a little uh, little room for uh, for some of us to maybe work our way in there. Um, <laughs> um, and so regarding Tatlock, um, you know that's a there's a lot of space there. I don't know if there are restrictions in terms of uh, being able to build a multi-purpose room that could be used for, you know, football meeting rooms during football season, you know, lacrosse meeting rooms, wrestling during the winter. I think gymnastics is a fall sport or spring sport. Like that multi-purpose, I think belongs there. It's <coughs> um, it, it's the right time to really look at it hard. I think that you'd find a lot of uh, community partnership uh, in terms of funding for something like that. Um, and so, you know, I'd really like it if we could really look at that hard now as we're, as we're building. So the plans didn't include it, but let's, uh, let's think about it now. Thank you. Anyone else interested in coming up, comment, sharing, question? Well, I'd like to thank you. You all took the time to come out here, uh, as we did, because it matters. It's important to all of us. It's exciting. Again, as I started and I opened, we're passionate about this. And we are very thankful to be in this community. And um, all of what you shared here tonight with your concerns and your questions is recorded and will be discussed. And part of the planning committee along with our architects take a look at where it is exactly we need to make any adjustments, if any, and what the future plans hold for Summit Public Schools. But I want to thank you very much for coming out and sharing your time with us tonight. Thank you.